A common position for a young lab technician is working in quality assurance or checking the consistency of a product's composition. Testing the quality of a product can mean a range of things. If you worked for an orange juice manufacturer, you might check for consistent concentrations of citric acid between batches of juice. Or, if you worked in pharmaceuticals, you might test that a crucial medication delivers the exact dosage needed for effective treatment. These outcomes rely on an essential technique in chemistry known as titration, that is, the precise addition of one substance of a known concentration to another substance with an unknown concentration. In this video, we'll explore the world of acid and base titrations, discuss common lab setups, and analyze conceptual interpretations of titration curves. As an HL student, you'll need to be able to understand the following concepts for any titration. You'll need to identify and explain differences in titration curves based on the types of acids and bases used in the reaction. When analyzing a titration curve, you'll need to be able to identify the equivalence point, as well as the volume of titrant used and the pH of the solution at the equivalence point. For titrations involving a weak acid or weak base, you'll need to identify the buffer region. And lastly, you'll need to choose an appropriate indicator that will depend on the acid and base involved in the titration. Let's start by discussing how we can set up a titration experiment and what we can expect from the general shape of our titration curve. Remember that in a titration, you have one substance of which you know its concentration and identity. That substance is called the titrant. We'll add our titrate to a burette from which it'll be carefully dispensed during the experiment. A burette is a piece of glassware that can make very precise measurements, so it's essential that we're using this piece of glassware correctly. First, be sure to record your initial volume of titrant in the burette, and to do so from the bottom of the meniscus curve created by the solution. The first time you make this measurement, you might notice something weird. The burette's measurement scale is backwards from other glassware. Don't worry, this is intentional. Remember that we're dispensing from the burette. So, since the 0 centimeter mark is at the top, we'll be able to more easily read how much titrant has been dispensed as we conduct our experiment. And no worries if your initial volume of titrant is not exactly at that 0 centimeter cubed mark. Just be sure to record the initial volume and adjust the volumes added throughout the experiment to see the actual volume dispensed. Remember, always record measurements to one point of estimation to make sure that you're reflecting the accuracy and precision of the instrument that you're using. Our next term is analyte, which is the substance whose identity or concentration we're trying to know more about. We add our analyte to a beaker or an Erlenmeyer flask, which we place beneath the burette. We'll measure the volume of analyte that we've added to our flask, and if we're conducting a pH titration, record its pH before and during the experiment. For example, let's say that our titrant is a base, and our analyte is an acid. On our graph, we'll see that pH is recorded on the y-axis, and the volume of our titrant used is recorded on the x-axis. We'll record the initial pH of the analyte solution first, when no base has been dispensed into the flask. Then, we'll dispense base into our acid solution until we see a small change in pH. In this example, it took about 10 centimeters cubed, to change the pH from 1.5 to 1.7. We'll keep up this pace and see a steady increase in our pH caused by an excess of acid in our solution. And if it's a weak acid, there's an additional buffering action that helps resist pH change. At a certain point, when we begin to run out of acid, we start seeing large jumps in the analyte's pH. Here, we'll slow down and start adding less of our titrant at a time. This is around where the equivalence point will be, so we'll want to be careful that we don't miss any meaningful data. After this rapid increase, we start to see our pH become more steady. This is because we now have a large excess of base in a reaction flask. After collecting some data in this range, we can now end our experiment. Titration curve data will tend to have this S-like shape, which becomes even more apparent when we draw our line of best fit. For us, we've color-coded this line so that it's more clear what the relative pH is for a given section and therefore which substance is in excess in the container. One of the most important pieces of information we'd like to identify with our data is the equivalence point, where the exact amount of titrant has been added to the analyte in our container, such that both reactants have been completely consumed. 
This point occurs at the inflection of our titration curve. To help identify the equivalence point, some titration experiments will use an indicator, which is a substance that changes color in acidic or basic solutions. This can be used in tandem to or even without pH data. Generally, indicators will change color after we've reached the equivalence point, as that is when we begin seeing an excess of our acid or base titrant. Although this change happens after we've passed the equivalence point, it's still a decent approximation when done correctly. There are a variety of indicators that we can choose from, some of which you can find in section 18 of the IB data booklet. When choosing an indicator for an experiment, we'll base our decision on the estimated pH range of our solution after the equivalence point. Color change is also dependent on the Ka and pKa of the indicator, which we'll also try to match to our estimated pH range. For example, the indicator seen in the previous demo is phenolphthalein, which turns pink in the presence of hydroxide ions. If we're trying to choose between two indicators, say phenolphthalein and phenol red, which share some overlap in their pH range, we can compare the target pH with the pKa of the indicator used. If the solution's pH were, say, closer to 9.6, we would choose phenolphthalein. As you can see, choosing an appropriate indicator for a titration isn't too complicated once you know the pH range just after the equivalence point. To predict this range, and the pH of our solution at the equivalence point, let's examine some different titration experiments and their corresponding pH data. While pH titration curves of monoprotic acids or bases all share this unique S shape, there are some key differences that depend on the type of acid and base used in the reaction, and which one is treated like the analyte or titrant. Let's break down each of these scenarios and talk about their differences. We'll start by looking at reactions between strong acids and strong bases. In general, neutralization reactions between an acid and a base will create water and a salt. For this reaction, let's use hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide as our strong acid and strong base. These reactants produce water and sodium chloride. Well, in this case, sodium chloride is literally table salt. In chemistry, salt just means some ionic compound so it's important that we don't get confused here. We use hydrochloric acid as our analyte, and sodium hydroxide as our titrant. This explains our low initial pH in our example data, as we'll only have hydrochloric acid in solution at the beginning of the reaction, as well as high final pH, as we'll have a large excess of sodium hydroxide base after we pass the equivalence point. In the beginning of the experiment, the pH of our reaction solution won't change very drastically. Keep in mind that in these initial stages, we have a large excess of hydrochloric acid in our container after each aliquot of sodium hydroxide base has been reacted. It's important that we don't confuse this with buffering action, which is a resistance to pH change caused by the presence of a weak acid and its weak conjugate base, neither of which we have here. We'll talk more on this later. Once the concentration of hydrochloric acid has been completely depleted, with the exact amount of required sodium hydroxide base, we reach the equivalence point. Recall that at this point, we only have products in our container. In this case, that would be water and sodium chloride. We see here that the pH at the equivalence point of a strong acid and strong base titration is said to always equal 7, which matches what we see in our graph. What causes this to be true? We might think of the particle representation of the sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid solutions to look like this, with the respective components of NaOH and HCl bonded together. In reality, these solutions look much different. Remember that a strong acid and base are identified as such based solely on their tendency to fully dissociate in solution. This means that our solutions really contain hydrogen, chloride, sodium, and hydroxide ions. And as such, when this reaction runs, the conjugate pairs they produce do not actually act as a conjugate acid and base, as the reverse reaction is too unfavorable to occur. This is why at the equivalence point, when we only have water and the sodium chloride ions of these dissociations left in our solution, we see a neutral pH. For contrast, let's see what happens when our reaction involves a weak acid and strong base. We'll swap our hydrochloric acid for the weak ethanoic acid and keep sodium hydroxide as our strong base. 
ethanoic acid as our analyte, and sodium hydroxide as our titrant. At first glance, this graph looks really similar to our last example. We have a low initial pH due to our weak acid, an initial resistance to pH change, and a sudden drastic change in pH, creating the inflection point of the curve, and a high final pH from the excess strong base added after the equivalence point has been reached. Let's look a little deeper and uncover what makes this graph unique. The use of a weak acid in this reaction will have at least two major consequences to our experiment. First, you'll notice a slight visual difference in our solution's initial resistance to pH change. And second, at the equivalence point, the pH is now greater than 7. We have a slightly basic solution. What's going on here? It turns out that these differences are actually related to each other. Let's go back to our particle representation to help us see why. As we previously established, strong acids and bases, like sodium hydroxide, will fully dissociate in solution. Therefore, a weak acid or base will not fully dissociate. Instead, we see the creation of conjugate acid and base pairs, like that created between ethanoic acid and the acetate ion. In the forward direction of this dissociation, ethanoic acid deprotonates, forming the acetate ion, and in the reverse dissociation, the acetate ion is able to act as a base, capturing a proton and reforming ethanoic acid. With that in mind, our particle representation should really be far more dynamic and show the equilibrium between the forward and reverse dissociations. As we add base to our weak acid, we create water and a salt. The salt in this reaction is sodium acetate. In solution, sodium acetate is really a dissociated sodium ion and acetate ion the latter of which we just identified as the conjugate base to ethanoic acid. As the reaction takes place, the increasing concentration of the acetate ions will cause the equilibrium of our dissociation to shift back toward the production of ethanoic acid. This is what keeps the pH relatively steady and generates what we call the buffer region of the titration curve. Buffering is an extremely important concept for living creatures. It's how our body fluids maintain their pH, ensuring that they remain within a narrow and optimal range for cellular functions. Buffers operate within a specific capacity, meaning that eventually, the addition of too much of our base will cause the buffer to break, allowing for the full consumption of the acid and the achievement of the equivalence point of the reaction. This is followed by the completion of the experiment. We can see this in action. In our particle representation, we see the consumption of ethanoic acid and hydrogen ions in solution, with the occasional reproduction of ethanoic acid from the acetate ions. If we stop our experiment at the equivalence point, we can identify the buffer region of the curve. Since there are only products at the equivalence point, we once again see the effect of the conjugate base of the weak acid used in the reaction. The presence of the acetate ions in this experiment causes the pH at the equivalence point to be basic and higher than 7. We'll of course make sure to finish the experiment so we can see the full titration curve, but hopefully we can identify now why we have a buffer region and why our pH is no longer neutral at the equivalence point. The concepts of buffering and a non-neutral equivalence pH show up in a similar way in our final two titration curves. For instance, in a weak base and strong acid titration, we see something that on the surface looks drastically different. But as we take a closer look, we'll see the same patterns. For this example, let's use ammonia as our analyte and hydrochloric acid as our titrant. You'll notice that our reaction looks a bit different. Without a strong base that will dissociate hydroxide ions, we lose the ability to make water as a product. Instead, we simply see the transfer of a hydrogen from hydrochloric acid to ammonia. This makes ammonium chloride, which, as an aqueous salt, is really an ammonium ion and a chloride ion. You have also likely noticed that our titration curve looks a bit backwards. This is because we've switched up our titrant and analyte. Ammonia, our analyte, giving us a high initial pH. Hydrochloric acid, our titrant, is acidic and is in excess after the equivalence point, giving us a low final pH. Even with these changes, the core concepts are really similar to a weak acid and strong base titration we still have a buffer region, marked by the minimal change in pH of the initial analyte solution. 
Here, the weak base resists a pH change due to the shifting equilibrium with its conjugate acid. We also still identify the equivalence point at the inflection of the titration curve. Our solution here has an acidic pH that's less than 7. Can you identify why? Remember that at the equivalence point, we only have products in solution, which in this case is ammonium chloride. We previously stated that in solution, this would be dissociated ammonium and chloride ions, and that ammonium was the conjugate acid to our ammonia base. This is what makes our solution acidic at the equivalence point. In our last example of an acid and base titration, we'll use a weak acid and a weak base. Let's react ethanoic acid and ammonia. Using both a weak acid and a weak base puts us in a peculiar situation, specifically when it comes to the equivalence point. With ethanoic acid as our analyte and ammonia as our titrant, we see a return to a low initial pH and high final pH. Our weak acid will still act as a buffer at the beginning of the reaction. However, as the pH slowly increases, we seem to lose some certainty in the identification of the equivalence point. To find out why, let's take a look at our product. Ammonium acetate will dissociate into acetate ions and ammonium ions. These ions are the conjugate of the weak acid and base used in the reaction. You can see the acetate ion paired with ethanoic acid, and the ammonium ion paired with ammonia. Since we'll have both acidic and basic ions at the equivalence point, the pH here will depend on their overall strength as acids and bases, as this measures how much they'll dissociate or capture hydrogen ions. If the acidic product is stronger, it'll dissociate more hydrogen ions, and the solution will be more acidic. Conversely, a stronger basic product will capture more hydrogen ions and make the solution more basic. In summary, we use titration experiments to identify unknown properties of our analyte solution through the careful addition of our titrant to our analyte. We record the changing pH of the analyte solution and volume of titrant added, and by graphing these data, we create a titration curve. As an HL student, you should now be able to identify differences in titration curves based on the strength of the acid and base used. You should be able to identify the equivalence point and the buffer region within the titration curve data. And finally, based on the expected pH range at the equivalence point, you should be able to identify the correct indicator to use for the experiment. Titrations are an essential tool for analytical chemistry. For IB students, mastering titration techniques and concepts will help you gain insight into the substances and reactions that you're exploring and prepare you for success in the laboratory.